The session now underway is titled, uh, Can Washington Keep Up With The Next Big Thing? I'm the moderator, Brink Lindsay. I'm a uh, scholar at the Kauffman Foundation, uh, which is a charitable foundation headquartered in Kansas City uh, that's uh, dedicated to promoting entrepreneurship, education, and economic innovation. Uh, let me assert the prerogatives of being moderator and, uh, and state that I, I don't believe that uh, this title is quite sufficient. Uh, it's not enough, I don't think, to ask, can Washington keep up with the next big thing? I think we must also simultaneously ask, can Washington keep from screwing up the next big thing? Uh, because there are, we need to be cognizant of risks on both sides. Uh, the question uh, imagines uh, dutiful but outstrapped, uh, wise, beneficent, public-spirited regulators uh, not able to keep up with the pell-mell rush of innovation and therefore allowing unwittingly uh, the next Frankenstein's monster on the loose. Uh, but at the same time, we know uh, that ham-handed and sometimes venal uh, regulators and policymakers can uh, get together with uh, vested interests uh, with a stake in the uh, uninnovative status quo uh, and squelch uh, the next big thing. Um, so, uh, with uh, our eye on both Scylla and Charybdis, uh, we're going to uh, try to shoot the straights. Uh, with, uh, with me today uh, to, uh, to tack back and forth between these two risks are Gary Marchant, uh, who is, uh, let me get his official title because it's quite grandiose. Uh, uh, I didn't pick it. Oh. <laughs> he is the Lincoln Professor of Emerging Technologies, Law and Ethics uh, at the Sandra Day O'Connor School of Law at Arizona State. Uh, we also have uh, Larry Downs, uh, who's a fellow at the Center for Internet and Society at Stanford Law School. Uh, he is the author of In Search of the Killer App, a term that I believe you coined. Stole. Stole. Even better. <laughs> With which you are closely associated. And most recently, uh, The Laws of Disruption, uh, Harnessing the New uh, Forces that Govern Business and Life in the Digital Age. And on my far left, not coincidentally, um, is Jim Thomas, a research program manager and writer for the ETC Group, a civil society organization dedicated to conservation and sustainable advancement of cultural and ecological diversity and human rights. Uh, let's, uh, let me lead things off with a question for Gary, uh, really aiming at the, at the question that was presented. Uh, you are involved with, a, uh, with an initiative called the Pacing Project that is looking precisely at this question of the ability of uh, policymakers and regulators to just keep up with, uh, with what's going on. Maybe you could tell me a little bit about that. Sure. I mean, we're looking at this question directly, and, and basically the answer is no, that our, our, our entities that we have in Washington as they're currently structured are simply going to be always left behind by the, the pace of technologies today. Um, if you look at our legislatures, the word you hear is gridlock, and I think you'll hear that a lot more in the next year or two. Uh, if you look at our regulatory agencies, at least in the academic circles, the word used is ossification. If you look at our courts, the word often used is glacial, that all three of our legal institutions are sort of moving slower at a time when technology has never been moving faster. And as a result, you get this widening gap. And um, I don't think it is a fact that you know, our regulators are bad or not doing the right thing. I think they're not capable in the current institutional structure to, to have uh, reasonable oversight of these kind of technologies. And, and, and to jump out there with bad law would be worse than no law. I mean, that we, we don't want bad regulation, and to jump ahead of the technologies would be bad. But the problem is we're just simply with these mechanisms not able to, to uh, provide meaningful oversight. And so the question is, what new can we do? And that's what our project's trying to address. And Jim, I, uh, I take it that you would share a similar uh, uh, sense of, of uh, insufficiency of of government oversight of emerging technologies, uh, maybe with a darker twist uh, than, than Gary uh, uh, alludes to. So why don't you, uh, why don't you tell me your, your spin on things? Um, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not the right person to answer the question, can Washington keep up? I'm a British African-born Brit living in French Canada. Um, I, I don't pretend to tell anyone in Washington what Washington can do. Um, but you know, from the outside, it's certainly, I, I, you know, it certainly depends which part of Washington or what part of government. I mostly follow UN. but. Um, that you know, there's a part of governments that actually are very good at keeping up with what's happening in technology. That you know, the, who's who's done most to drive synthetic biology? It's probably the Genomes to Life project of the Department of Energy. Um, the the nano what we've seen in nanotech is very much being driven by uh, the National Nanotechnology Initiative. There is there's, there's a lot of there's a lot driven there. But there's a you know the the side of government that's about 
care and welfare and, and, and protection, that, that's miles behind. And, and, and you know, I, I'm actually more interested in the question not, can Washington keep up? Can the rest of the world and the governments who, who are responsible for most of the planet keep up with uh, the impacts of unexpected So let's, let's just we'll stipulate that. that we're using Washington metaphorically yeah, here. Yeah. Um, so what, what are the roots of this incapacity uh, to keep up? Why uh, 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 government has ample resources, has taxing power, it has uh, all kinds of coercive authorities. Uh, uh, up against any particular private interest, uh, it bulks quite large. What, what is it that, is, that has governments outgunned? Well, I mean, I think we've, we've heard some of it around money. We've heard some of it in, in the discussion already. Um, but I, I think there's a deeper problem with, uh, you know, the, the, the side of governments that, that do track emerging technologies reasonably well, who are interested in, in driving forth innovation to captain the, captain the economy, um, uh, also uh, exercise a sort of uh, a role of cowing, uh, the ability of, of whether it's the EPA or, or, or the environment agencies or the, the health and safety to, to ask tough questions because there's a sense that strategically countries need to rush ahead with these technologies and, and not put any kind of brakes on them. Um, and I think that even where there is interest within governments to question what is the impact of these, these hugely disruptive technologies, whether it's synthetic biology, nanotechnology, the, some of the, the climate technologies we're about to see. Um, there's a, there's a sort of a directive almost. To, you, don't, you don't rock that boat. We need to be up ahead. We need to be, we need to be pushing as fast as possible. I think that, that, that reduces the ability of those agencies to, to be critical and ask critical questions. Now, Larry, your focus is uh, in the uh, information and communication technology sector, not the SIN bio sector. Uh, but in, in your world, uh, the the second question that I posed uh, is one that has come up again and again. Uh, one of the speakers uh, tomorrow, Tim Wu, in his book, The Master Switch, chronicles uh, uh, in depressing detail how the FCC again and again wound up in cahoots with vested interests to squelch the next big thing, delaying uh, the introduction of FM radio, delaying the introduction of television, delaying uh, the introduction of cable television. Uh, so maybe you can address this second question and what you see uh, as the environment today in terms of the posture of, of, of uh, policymakers, regulators uh, versus the emerging technologies of, of uh, the information world. Yeah, and I, well, and I would, I would actually rather use the phrase disruptive technologies, which is a, a phrase from Clayton Christensen's work, because I think that's where the distinction comes in terms of what governments and regulators and legislators and courts can and can't do. So if you're talking about disruptive technology and the, you know, the, the name sort of speaks for itself, you're talking about something that's, that's changing industries and in the case of the internet is changing everything uh, at a very quick pace and in fact, you know, technology is essentially following the speed of Moore's law which is, you know, everything gets faster and smaller and cheaper all the time. The institutional problems, this is the best case scenario, the institutional problem is that modern democracies are by design, and by the way, it's a good design, are deliberative, they're incremental, and they're slow to change. And of course, in most situations, that's exactly what we want. We don't really want, you know, sort of the, our passions to run away with us. The problem is when those kinds of institutions are trying to regulate technologies that are changing at an accelerating pace, the mismatch is obvious. And, and you know, it's hundreds of examples of even the best uh, intended laws trying to help, trying to regulate, trying to solve problems that come up as a result of the introduction of these disruptive technologies, at best they're out of date before the ink is even dry. Now the worst case scenario, I think this gets more to, to what uh, Tim was writing about, is that uh, you know, the best intentions aren't always the intentions that, that legislators have. You look at you know, the history of disruptive technologies and what you really see in terms of regulation is almost to, uh, to, to every example, governments either being naive, being parochial, uh, or being cynical. And we talk about examples of all of those just in the last 10 years with the internet. Uh, they're, they're captured perhaps by industry, they're, they're after their own best interests, so you know, governments extending their power to, to do electronic surveillance uh, in ways that they wouldn't be able to do in the physical world, but they think they can get away with it in the electronic world. These are sort of natural tendencies. Uh, and, uh, and, and so, in, in that sense, the worst case scenario is what happens when we get bad intended laws uh, trying to regulate the internet or trying to regulate other disruptive technologies, which again, can't keep up, can't keep pace as well. So 
So let's get specific. Tell me uh, a couple of areas today where you think uh, uh, Washington is getting it wrong or is, is uh, <clears throat> squelching uh, uh, innovation, or is it uh, is the flip side the case? Is, are there important areas where there's a desperate need for, uh, for government to act to head off bad events down the, down the road and, and it isn't getting its act together? Yeah, so I don't know, if, and I wouldn't use the word, I don't mean to quibble on words, but I wouldn't use the word squelch in most cases because I don't think in most cases it makes a difference uh, what governments do and don't do. I mean, the internet is a terrific technology for optimizing around inefficiencies. If you look at you know, any laws, not just talking about in the United States, but elsewhere, where sort of dumb laws have been passed, you know, the internet just basically finds a way to route around them anyway. So, you know, we it ban has, gambling, has, we ban porn. For well, for a few days. <laughs> so I'm, you know, I'm taking a slightly bigger picture uh, than, than, you know, a two-day period. We see how that's going to end, I think, as well, in terms of how long that it was able to, to stay off. So I, I think there are ways in which, however, you know, governments are skewing the deployment of disruptive technologies and interfering with maybe what would be the natural course that they would take to sort of stick with the evolutionary theme of, of earlier this morning. Um, I've, I've written so much about net neutrality in the last year, even I can't read what I write anymore. I'm so <laughs> bored with it. Um, but I think that's an excellent example of, uh, of bad regulation, of, a, of sort of, you know, the, the premise was wrong, the process was wrong, the end result was wrong, nobody was happy with the end result, except perhaps, you know, the chairman of the FCC, He's the only one who, who, you know, was enthusiastic about it. I think, you know, obviously uh, the COICA bill, which would expand the power of the Department of Homeland Security to seize domain names, is coming back up. This internet, supposed internet kill switch that uh, Senator Lieberman is pushing. These are all examples of, you know, kind of the terror reaction uh, to technology because, you know, to the extent we don't understand it. Uh, on the flip side, yes, there are very important things that governments can and should do. Uh, certainly, if we want to stick, you know, very locally in terms of, you know, this uh, sort of square mile. Uh, right now, the most important thing, I think, in terms of the technologies that, that my clients in Silicon Valley care about would be spectrum reform. Uh, the, the mobile internet is obviously growing in leaps and bounds. Wonderful things are happening. Uh, but uh, there's a real likelihood that, uh, that we will run out of available spectrum uh, if we don't start a process now because, you know, the FCC is the only one who can license spectrum. They're the ones who keep track of who has it and who don't. By the way, we don't have an inventory uh, of who has it and who don't, so that, that would really be a good start right there. But that would be an excellent example of where government could do something quite useful to help the technologies reach their maximum human potential. So why don't you, uh, Gary, why don't you spell out a little bit uh, what needs to happen uh, for government to be able to expand its capacities and be able to, to uh, play the role that it needs to play? Well, let me give you two examples, of, I think, one of, of over-regulation, one of under-regulation, and, and, and what might be needed there. So on the over-regulation example, I think right now is GM crops. Uh, I know they're controversial, but if you look at the record, it's pretty well established now. These have created tremendous benefits in terms of reduced environmental impacts, no harms, extremely well studied. And what we're doing is we're basically requiring every GM crop to go through millions and millions of dollars of safety tests. And you can do the exact same product without genetic engineering with zero safety and oversight. So we're basically tilting the scales against these products. Uh, the result is the only people who can actually get one of these approved are large corporations. All the, pu you know, the public research institutes and the universities have had to stop their projects because they can't possibly afford the $50 million to get them approved. And so all the ones that were intended for developing countries and so on have been squelched by regulation. Uh, in the meantime, the only ones that can possibly survive are these commercially successful ones. And now on top of that, some groups have basically taken advantage of a, a law called NEPA and says if this is a government action, uh, the government, even though we've studied these things, $50 million of safety tests, the government now has to turn around and do a full environmental impact statement taking two or three years, costing millions of taxpayers money, and repeatedly the courts in the last couple of years have required them to go back and do this and blocking it even further. And you step back and you say, this is just a mess. Here we got a product that's proven benefits, uh, no risks, very well studied compared to any other food, and yet we're absolutely suppressing it with regulation. So that is an example going too far that way. 
One, the other side, I think, is nanotechnology right now. Again, there's thousands of these nanotech products coming on board. Uh, it's impossible that none of them present a risk, but it's almost impossible for a traditional regulation to govern these. We can't even have a, a scientifically and legal robust definition of what is nanotechnology. And the result is we basically have no oversight of this. Uh, these agencies are sort of slowly moving forward, but they're you know, four or five years away from any meaningful regulation. And, and what do we do in the meantime? If, if something goes wrong, you know, this, that'll, you know, read down to every single product that has the word nanotech on it and, and, and cause tremendous economic harm to those companies as well as whoever, the, you know, the unfortunate people are harmed by those products. So we need something else there. Traditional regulation just isn't going to cut it. So uh, the idea that's emerging from a lot of work in the, in the legal community right now is the idea of sort of more soft law things, not to replace regulation but to supplement it. And uh, I agree with Michael Crow when he said that, you know, the, the, how we deal with law and, and technology is, is basically a newborn. We're, we're really just starting to think of new models of how to do this. But there's an urgent need to think of more of those, and uh, that's one of the, the, the things we're trying to do at ASU. Jim, do you think uh, GM crops are uh, overregulated? Absolutely not. not. Certainly not in this country. I mean, you know, you're looking at a, a quite wide penetration. And um, you know, the, the problem with GM crops is that, uh, uh, that, you know, you seem to think the reason why they're in the hands of the Monsantos and the, is, is because of the regulation, quite the opposite. That's where it came from. That's where the technology came from. These are, have been a tool to, to, to concentrate the marketplace and to gain control over seed companies. And it's not that there's a, a lack of, uh, you know, stifling innovation means that it hasn't gone to the south. It's never, that was never the target. Um, that was always a PR trick. You know, we're going to feed the hungry and so forth. That was never what uh, farmers in the south were asking for in the global south. Now, what we're about to see and we're beginning to see is actually those same companies are going to the south. They're taking what they call uh, abiotic stress tolerance, uh, so-called climate-ready crops. And they're going to start taking that to the south as a way of taking over land as part of a general land grab that's happening right now that's going to push more farmers off land. Um, so I, I just think you're, you know, you're, well, I mean, you're mixing up cause and effect no, there. I but, and I, but I agree with you on nanotechnology. Right. I agree with you sure. that there we do have a situation where we have you know, 1,600 at least. That's what's a what's known to be in the market, but probably thousands more uh, that haven't been uh, even described. We, as you say, we can't even describe what a, what a nanotech product is. Um, and uh, where there's an unwillingness on the part of regulators to, to move towards that. And I, I go back to my earlier comment. That's because there's a, since 2000, there's, a, there's a, an imperative and a belief that you need to be at the front of some global nano race to, to, to realize benefits for, for the US economy. Well, 10 years later, after the National Nanotechnology Initiative, we're not seeing that. The nano market hasn't exploded and become the driver of the economy. It hasn't worked like that. But meanwhile, we're exposed to a lot of risks in but products every day that aren't even labeled or even understood by government. But even, even, even just, just assume then that these companies are these big, bad, evil cre creatures. I don't think they're quite uniformly that way. The point I was making, there was a lot of other people in the biotech, in, in the biotech area in the 80s and the 90s. Uh, universities, uh, public research institutes who were developing crops with much more humanitarian and commercial goals, it's impossible for them to get a product approved. You do not have $50 million there to go through the USDA and FDA approval processes. So what our regulation has done is basically taken those people out of the market. They can no longer produce their but products. But as you said, you're able to do it without using genetic modification. You're able to get those same traits. So why go that route right. with uh, you know, a number of, of risks and questions associated, whether that's pleiotropic secondary effects or ecological impacts of escaping trans genes, when you can use traditional breeding methods because, or because you can use the methods. what you can do is you can radiate them and then you'll get 50 other mutations along the chromosome. We know these are more dangerous and yet they get no regulatory oversight. So we're intentionally creating a less efficient, more dangerous product because of this regulatory no, uh, that's a good mess example. we have. There's an example where we also haven't got proper oversight. Um, but you know, in terms of developing whether it's drought tolerance or whatever, that, that's been done through breeding by farmers all around the world for centuries. Um, farmers have ways of developing uh, extremely good crops so appropriate for their, for their own terrain. Um, the difference is that you've had a set of crops developed for, uh, for large commodity markets by Monsanto to, to increase their pesticide sales. You know, that's really all that's happened. It's, uh, Jim, it seems to me that you uh, are concerned not only about uh, health, safety, and environmental risks uh, from, uh, from new uh, biotech Technologies, uh, but also economic risks. Uh, that is, that uh, that <clears throat> high-tech producers can displace uh, from uh, from developed countries can displace uh, uh, traditional producers in uh, less developed regions. Uh, isn't this an old, old story that's called economic progress? That is, that the more efficient uh, uh, product, the lower-cost product, or the higher-value product, 
uh, wins the day uh, and that the folks who, uh, who can't offer market value uh, at a profit go under. And it's it's it, absolutely an old story. And on a global level, it's been a disastrous story. You, know, you look back at the history of synthetic chemistry where you had the development of synthetic dyes in the, sort of the 1850s, 1860s. Um, and within, within a span of maybe 20 years, that had put out of work thousands, I mean, hundreds of thousands, of, uh, of indigo growers in, in, in Bihar and, and Bengal. Um, that's, that's a good example of what Dan Sarowitz was describing this morning as these, these creative waves of destruction where there's always winners and losers. Now, if we know that we're creating these waves now, and we really are with things like synthetic biology and nanotechnology and the converging technologies, then we have to pay attention to who are going to be the, the losers, who's going to be cleared away by these waves. And, and if there's a, a disparity between, if you're looking at destroying the, the livelihoods of, uh, of many hundreds of thousands of people who are already in, in, in very economically vulnerable positions in order to improve the, the position of, of a particular market player, then there's a justice question and you need to have structures that will deal with that justice question. Well, I was going to, I was going to put a very different spin on this old story, uh, that is that the creative destruction of, uh, of technological innovation and, uh, and market-mediated uh, technological innovation is the story of the liberation of, uh, of humanity from, from mass poverty and from billions and billions of people being alive today that otherwise wouldn't. Our population has gone up as life expectancy has, has gone up, as education levels have gone up. All the indicators on the Human Development Index are going up. The last 25 or 30 years are the period of the most rapid, dizzying pro progress for humanity overall uh, in, uh, in all of history. But that's an and, and that is a process that is completely inseparable from, the way I understand it, uh, unprofitable, inefficient producers going out of business. Well, that's, I mean, that's an ideological argument, and you can, you can point to uh, social innovation as being the basis of improvements in health and life expectancy, not just technological innovation. Um, and, uh, you know, producers going out of business, uh, I think if we're talking about, for example, synthetic biology, one of the impacts pr probably is going to be if you're, uh, you're, you're moving to producing materials in vats that previously were made by farmers in the south, whether they're Artemisia farmers or rubber tappers or whatever, um, putting those people off the land in a very short period of time um, and, and taking over their land in order to grow biomass, that's the sort of story we're going to have with the, the growth of a biomass-based synthetic biology economy. Um, that's, that's not a, there's no justice or improvement in their lives or improvement in their livelihoods. That throws them into poverty, and poverty is the, you know, the first indicator of, of, reducing, uh, of reducing lifespan. After the, the Industrial Revolution, we were talking about different... Uh, uh, different anniversaries. This is the 200th anniversary of the, the Industrial Revolution, or at least the resistance to it. The Luddites were 200 years ago this year. Um, we saw a reduction in the, UK, in the UK. We saw a reduction in lifespans, and, and people shortened, became shorter, uh, as, as, the, as hunger bit, as, as they lost jobs and income. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not an upward trend, that, you know, always. I wouldn't at all want to sugarcoat the fact that there are losers in yeah. the story of economic uh, progress. Uh, but... Uh, but to uh, there, there is absolutely a risk that that uh, paying uh, too much attention uh, to short-term dislocations uh, can deprive us of enormous long-term gains. I'd like to bring. Can, can I just ask sure. one point on this? So, so I think something that is new about these technologies is that a lot of the technologies in the past, like nuclear radiation or pesticides, the concerns we had are basically health risks that. Theoretically, at least, we could uh, uh, govern with our, our agencies. What's different, I think, about a lot of the technologies today, like synthetic biology or genetically engineered crops or uh, nanotechnologies, a lot of the public concerns aren't so much direct health risks. They're these more broader social, economic, ethical type concerns. And one of the problems with our regulatory structures, we have no way to accommodate those concerns. A, a good example is recently on uh, uh, milk and, and meat from cloned animals. Uh, the FDA found there was no health risk from those, uh, took public comment and got tens of thousands of comments, not so much addressing the health risk, but saying we have these broader ethical social concerns about these types of products in our food. I don't happen to share those personally, but tens of thousands of people took the time to write in. And the FDA, I think legally correct, said we can't look at that. Sorry, uh, thanks for writing, but we can't talk about that. We can only talk about safety and efficacy. So basically telling them you're out of bounds, that when you talk to your government about these issues, your concerns, we can't consider those. That doesn't seem the right way to run the railroad, that there needs to be some way 
to engage people. That's what they're really worried about, to be able to talk to their government and have a, a dialogue on that. It, it's problematic. It starts to overlap with religious issues. Do we really want our government sort of making religious pronouncements? So it's a difficult issue to address, but we're not structurally able to do it right now. I want to bring Larry back into the conversation, and so I want to swing back around to the IT okay. uh, sector. That you haven't mentioned. You mentioned uh, biotech and uh, and nano. Uh, is is IT Goldilocks? Are they getting it just right there, or uh, or? Or no, not. but I, I, I see IT sort of a, a 10 years or 15 years ahead of these other technologies. I mean, it's really changing our life today. I see these other technologies going to be uh, hitting in the next few years. I think these other ones do raise, I think, uh, more multi-dimensional issues than the IT does. But the IT, I think, is a great example that, that we can look at and learn from. I mean, I think groups like ICANN, when we talk about international oversight, are, are very good models to look at. So I think there's a lot we can learn from that. I think it's a little bit more mature. It's a little bit ahead of where these other technologies are. You may be sick of, uh, of your own writings on these subjects, but you're more familiar with them than, uh, than some of us are. So why don't, why don't you uh, give us uh, sort of brief spiels on a couple of the, uh, of the, uh, the topics that you mentioned, uh, net neutrality and the internet kill switch. Uh, sure, and uh, I should say, ha hearing this conversation, I'm so glad that I focus on information technology because <laughs> I don't want to deal with any of these other issues. It's, it's so much more fun. Um, <laughs> And safe, apparently. You know, the worst thing that happens on the internet is, you know, someone, you know, defames or slanders you um, or steals your identity and wrecks your credit score, but at least you don't mutate. <laughs> at least, not yet, not yet. Yeah, exactly. Um, look, one of, the, one of the things that's worth, I think, pointing out, because particularly, uh, you know, if this conversation were happening in Silicon Valley, I mean, most of my colleagues would be very bemused by the question of sort of, you know, what can Washington do? What should Washington do? It's like, we don't really think about Washington. I mean, I like Washington. Personally, I spend a lot of time here. But, you know, most of the information technology Google companies. Google has a DC office. Well, you know, we all have a DC office. Um, so even if you're not thinking about Washington, Washington is thinking about you. Well, that, of course, and that is, by the way, there's a genetic defect, I think, in Silicon Valley that says if you don't pay attention to Washington, it will go away. Mm -hmm. uh, Ask Microsoft, ask uh, Intel, ask uh, Oracle, ask a lot of companies that have dealt with the Department of Justice over the last 10 years and you realize that's not true. Uh, so it, you know, it is something both that Silicon Valley needs to pay more attention to, but also I think it's worth understanding that in Silicon Valley we just don't think about what is the proper role of, reg how is regulation going to save us, how is regulation going to skew us, how is regulation going to mess us up. And one of the things I think it's worth noting is, in, again, it's in very early stages, but uh, I'm very encouraged by what I see as signs of, you know, sort of the internet as, um, as a frontier. I, I made this point in my uh, Slate piece, which infuriated most of the readers of Slate. But I said that um, the internet is like the American West in a lot of key respects. And one of those is that it doesn't really accept transplanted legal institutions being forced on it. Uh, it rejects those. And at the same time, it develops its own organic structures that make much more sense. So you see, I mean, even 10 years ago, eBay introduced the buyer-seller rating system. It was a very efficient, you know, from a Ronald Coase standpoint, it was a brilliantly low transaction cost way of policing certain kinds of behavior. It wasn't perfect by any means, but it policed certain behaviors on eBay. It did it in a very nice way. That's evolved, I think, today. You see on uh, Facebook in particular, because it's a social networking site because they give their users the tools to organize again in a very efficient way. Every time Facebook makes a change to its terms of service, particularly having to do with privacy, you know, the Facebook users, they speak up. And, and if they're not happy, and sometimes it's mob rule, but they do get their voices heard, they get changes made. And I think that's the beginnings of what you might think of as sort of frontier law uh, on, uh, on the internet. Uh, it's not coming from a traditional regulator. It's not coming from, you know, the folks back east the way it didn't come, you know, it's sort of posses and, and, and hanging trees now. But it can evolve, and I think it will evolve to something much more organic and much more suitable for this unique kind of uh, environmental properties of digital life. And, and that's what I find uh, so encouraging about it. Okay, the, uh, the net neutrality uh, flap doodle uh, that's been going on for years now uh, is is uh, born of the idea that, that sort of self-made frontier law isn't good enough, yeah. uh, that in fact uh, this process that Tim Wu describes of previously open technologies uh, being 
uh, sort of taken over uh, by uh, big interests and closed uh, to uh, competition and innovation is there's a risk of that happening uh, on the internet uh, and uh, <clears throat> and therefore we need uh, uh, sort of a regulatory apparatus to, to nip those malign trends in the bud so do you do you think so things like that have happened in the past is the analogy to of those past uh, uh, problems to the present wrong-headed or where in 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 your uh, mind or is just the remedy not the right one or so where where is this uh, initiative going wrong in your well, so I haven't finished Tim's book I don't want to misrepresent yeah, but I'm, it I, but don't single him out there's uh, there's lots of advocates for uh, uh, there are certainly examples of, of industry capture and of technologies uh, particularly because of the high network effects of, of information technologies where companies become quite dominant but I think as Tim also points out in the book those dominant monopolies don't last very long uh, and often they get broken up not by government intervention, but by just sort of the next stage. It's like a creative destruction, but kind of on steroids from a Schumpeterian standpoint. It just happens faster all the time. The problem with the, you know, I tried for the whole last year to get people in Silicon Valley worked up about the net neutrality debate. They couldn't care less. Uh, they didn't really see it as an issue. They didn't really care if something got passed or didn't get passed. Uh, because from their standpoint, yes, of course, there's a risk that bad things will happen. But the idea that the, the FCC, and I don't mean to single out the FCC, is a, again, it's, a, it's an institution that has, by design, incremental and deliberative features. The idea that the FCC could, to use the FCC's own word, prophylactically figure out what the right rules might be to solve a problem that hasn't exactly materialized yet uh, just didn't make any sense to, uh, to, to people back in California. And I, I think, in particular, what I was most struck by, so over, you know, I'm a very bo boring, lonely person. Over the Christmas break, I read the FCC's report, which they issued the day before Who did? Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, 200 pages, it, it was a remarkable effort. <laughs> One of the things that struck me in coming through that was to realize that from the beginning of the, so really, you know, the FCC acknowledged, I think, at the beginning of that process last October. Uh, that they really hadn't looked at the internet and how it had evolved for a very long time. And they, they asked a lot of the original NPRM asked for feedback on how has the internet evolved? What's actually happened since the last time we took a close look at it? And obviously they got lots and lots of feedback on that. And I think if you look at how the report uh, ends up and how the final order comes out, one of the things you realize is that the FCC understood uh, at least the details, if not, you know, they sort of got the trees but not the forest, that the internet of 2010 is a very, very different environment than the internet of, of 1996. So if you go through the report, you find exception after exception after exception. You know, content delivery networks are exempted, and uh, e-book readers, which offer internet access, are exempted. Coffee shops are exempted. Mobile broadband is treated differently. Uh, peering and caching arrangements are exempted. So on and so forth. What you realize is that they got the message that uh, you know, there was a lot of non-neutral behavior going on, but that that had evolved from an engineering standpoint, from a business standpoint, to optimize behaviors that consumers wanted. And so they said, okay, well, we're going to put those 15 things to the side and say, they're okay, those technologies, those business arrangements, they're fine. Going forward, no more. And if you think you've got a network management practice that is good and improves things, and even if it appears to be non-neutral, even if it doesn't have an anti-competitive direct impact, you still have to come to us and get approval for it before you go ahead. That's, I think, where they miss the forest for the trees. Let's uh, go back to the big picture and, and sort of take it back a step. Uh, is it possible for governments to keep up with technological change in an intelligent way? It seems like uh, there are some massive handicaps under which uh, uh, a, uh, uh, you know, <clears throat> a beneficent and public-spirited uh, policymaker is operating. Um, uh, first of all, uh, uh, you are in a centralized, deliberative decision-making process that's answerable to all kinds of different uh, stakeholders and interests, uh, and you are dealing with an emergent, bottom-up, uh, decentralized phenomenon so that it's whack-a-mole. If you try to deal with it here, something's going to pop out there. So there's, there's this problem of uh, sort of uh, centralized and lumbering versus uh, decentralized and agile. Uh, secondly, there are just enormous information asymmetries uh, 
the, uh, the people who know most about the next thing uh, are not government actors. They're people out uh, in the private sector or out in universities. They're people out in the world. Uh, and uh, the regulators depend on the regulated for the information they need to regulate. So uh, given those facts, what is it, how is it, what, what is realistic to expect of governments? Uh, it's pretty limited in a lot of ways. I mean, so I, I think you've got to, you know, distinguish legislatures from regulatory agencies. The legislatures like Congress, I mean, uh, they only address an issue, you know, a window every how many years or decades in many cases, and then it sort of gets fixed there forever. And so you basically have outdated legislation very quickly, and then they never come back and, and revisit it. Uh, a good example right now is the Clean Water Act adopted in 1972. The, the, the fine water pollution is coming from a point source. Uh, today, 90% of the water pollution comes from non-point sources. It's not regulated by our Clean Water Act. It's completely an outdated statute. We've known that for 20 years, but Congress hasn't got around to fixing it yet. Uh, and so you get these, uh, the, the Delaney Clause is another example that banned all carcinogens in food. It's impossible to ban carcinogens in food. There's just food, uh, they're everywhere, uh, natural and artificial. Uh, and so this idea that, you know, a risk in 1 in 10 to the 19, 10 to the 19, 10 to the minus 14, you were not allowed, just made no sense in the real world. Scientists all knew that, but it took them 20 years until a court order forced EPA to ban all food in the United States before Congress finally stepped in. So we have these statutes that get adopted by Congress and then they stay there forever. So Congress, I don't think, is a very good uh, agency, uh, entity, to deal with these kind of fast-moving problems. You look at regulatory agencies, they're stuck by the statutory mandate. They can't operate in a flexible way. Uh, a great example, again, is the is Project XL program that EPA started in the 90s. You had problems like Intel. They had a facility near where we are in, 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 in Phoenix. They were basically changing their chip every six months. And every time they changed their chip, they had to get a new uh, permit from the state. That took two years for the permit to get approved. It just was completely incompatible with a, a business model. EPA, to its credit, stepped in and said, hey, why don't we think of a better way? Why don't we sort of look more broadly and, 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 and step back from these, regulate, these statutes and say, if you can improve the environment overall, get buy-in from the local public interest groups, uh, we will allow you to uh, make these changes without getting a permit renewal uh, if you get a bigger, more bang for the buck, more environmental improvement. That was a great solution. And then Congress came along and said, you're not allowed to do that. That's violating the statutes. So these agencies are confined within these very narrow mandates and can't think proactively in a lot of ways. So I think we have to, uh, you know, agencies and, and Congress obviously have their place, but we have to be thinking of other institutions, other mechanisms, other partnerships. Uh, you look at nanotechnology, I think one of the best things that's going on is something like a DuPont and EDF combining together to create a nano risk framework where you get a public interest group and industry together, figuring out here's a sensible way to control the risk of your products. Uh, move much more quickly than any of these agencies or Congress can do. Except the DuPont don't even use their own, their own framework. They've only used it for one, I think, one thing. So, you know, it's actually gone nowhere in that case. Um, I'd true. like to answer your question, yes, please. please. Um, and I'd like to answer it not from, you know, Washington again. I'd like yep. to answer the question, you know, so what, what, what could Addis Ababa do or what could yes. Lusaka do or somewhere? Um, you know, the, the, what governments like that that really are stressed in terms of the issues they have to deal with, the, the, the lack of resources they have available and, and the, so forth. Um, what they rely on are, are international institutions. They rely very much on the institutions provided by the United Nations or even the Bretton Woods institutions. Um, and, and ironically, the very institutions that would have given them some sort of heads up for what's going to hit them technologically got dismantled in the middle of the 90s. You know, you had the uh, International Center on, on, on Transnationals taken apart. Um, also here, the, the Office of uh, Technology Assessment taken apart. Um, the, the, the need for an institution globally, but also you know, nationally, of networks of institutions that are able to, to track and have the mandate to go to governments and say, you have to be watching this and you have to be watching that, and don't worry about this, this is fine. And, um, and it's able to not just uh, pull from experts, but able to bring lay, uh, lay assessment into that. And you know, that's, you know, here we are at Google. That there are many ways through social media we can begin to do interesting lay assessment of technologies very rapidly. Um, and, and, and we do all the time in some ways, bringing that together and, and, and having an institution that brings together that sort of very quick, rapid assessment of technologies and, and is able to bring it quickly to who matters. At the moment, there's no, there's no institutional actor that has that role. Um, and civil society tries to do it, but civil society is even more underfunded than you know, academics and, and so forth. So in your mind, then, the, what, what needs to be done is sort of institution building, building up institutions that monitor uh, technology risks. Yeah, specifically, I mean, specifically, um, an international convention for evaluating new technologies to be able to do 
horizon scanning and be able to identify what are the, the technologies that, that we should pay attention to and then put them in some sort of process to bring it to, to, to governments and other bodies for whom that matters. And building social, whether it's social media or, or, or cultural institutions where, where the rapidly develop knowledge and assessment of technologies. Can I answer your question as well? Please. Um, so from my standpoint, I, there's an there's a apocryphal story that at the first day of internship for, uh, for residents in the emergency room, the first thing they're told is, don't just do something, stand there. Uh, and I think that's a wonderful model when it comes to disruptive technologies. There's one thing I think, and again, we're going to talk nostalgically about what, what worked in the past. One thing that, that particularly national governments used to do quite effectively uh, that they don't do anymore, and that's funding basic research. Um, basic research, you know, in the market, the costs are very difficult to determine, the benefits are very difficult to determine, so a lot of basic research doesn't happen or doesn't happen on the best possible time frame. Obviously, the Internet itself, although it wasn't the intention of the Department of Defense to build what we have now, but at least from a serendipitous standpoint, the, uh, the, the funding that was done on the basic initial protocols of TCAIP, of course, were very important in, in what's actually now developed into something very, very different. Uh, we're not funding those next generation happenstances and, and accidental discoveries uh, today, at least certainly not to the, to the extent and with the same enthusiasm that we were even 10 years ago, but certainly not 20 years ago. I don't expect that to change, but if I could change one thing, that's what it would be. Gary, uh, what's your take on uh, Jim's uh, critique of sort of the dismantling or under uh, 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 supply of national-based and international monitoring that I think having a, a technology assessment institution is an important thing to have that we are uh, under uh, utilized on. I, uh, so some interesting examples recently of, of Great Britain and Singapore uh, creating such entities that are looking forward and trying to anticipate where things are going and trying to give early warning to governments of, of issues coming uh, down the pipeline. I think that's a great uh, type of institution to have and, and I think losing the Office of Technology Assessment was a shame and we need something like it, maybe a little bit more nimble, not doing sort of two-year studies of what was yesterday's issues, but what are the issues uh, coming up in the future? I think we need that. I think another type of organization to think about is some kind of, uh, I'm Canadian too, uh, is a law reform commission. It's a Canadian event. Uh, um, although I became a U.S. citizen this week, so I'm both. Um, but um, uh, Canada and Great Britain have a thing called the Law Reform Commission, whose job it is to basically look at existing laws and say where they're outdated, where they need to be updated. Maybe we need something like that so we have these old laws on the books that get sort of out of date, that there's some kind of institution that's looking at those and putting forward recommendations for updating them and keeping them current with technology and other factors. So, again, just to stress my second question, uh, aren't there, so I, here I painted this picture of governments just can't possibly keep up with what's going on and maybe you can uh, tinker a little bit with, with, uh, with ramping up some uh, monitoring institutions, but still, it's going to be David versus Goliath. Uh, so it's rearranging deck chairs, deck uh, chairs on the Titanic. Yeah. But, but isn't there then, on the other side, uh, enormous sort of forces of inertia and, uh, and, and uh, uh, stasis? That is, uh, you have, um, as we've seen from the Hollywood clips, uh, a public that is, has a great appetite for, uh, for sort of hysterical fears about things that really aren't that scary. Uh, you have a media that loves uh, to thrive on, on sensation and, uh, and if it bleeds, it leads, or uh, if it may bleed 20 years from now, it still leads. Um, and uh, also you have uh, often, uh, in, in particular industrial configurations, uh, big entrenched interests who don't like the next disruptive technology yep. because they're not going to be in charge of it and therefore they have huge incentives to work together with, uh, uh, with governments to head, head off that challenge of the past. See, I, I don't recognize, I mean, I kind of recognize what you're saying, obviously, it's, it's a trope, um, but I, I think you could, you could see it in a different way. Um, that uh, what you actually have, if I look at the media around technology, I see one after another wonder story for what technology is going to deliver tomorrow, yep. which is entirely wrong. and. In, Entirely hype in order to generate profit, um, or to generate revenue, or to generate funding, or something like I think, that. Don't you see both? Well, is you it, see both, there, but I, I isn't there I, hype, I, of the yeah. so hype of the promise and hype of the? you've got both peril. of those at play for yeah. sure. Um, yeah, what I see in terms of uh, government's inability to move, governments could move. Um, you know, so for example, nanomaterials. Uh, the governments are relying, so far as they're relying on anyone on on a. a the charity of organizations, civil society groups, and so forth, to try and come up with lists. Tomorrow, the EPA and the FDA could say, we require, we, we're going to create a list of every single product on the marketplace that has nanomaterials in. Um, in fact, the Canadians are probably going to do it. The European Parliament is pushing for it. 
Um, but they, they've refused to do that. They don't want to do that. They don't want to do that because the industry pushes back. And what you have is uh, you know, the, the sanctity of this sort of innovation-led uh, economy uh, that says, well, let's, let's not just rock the boat. Uh, that's, I think that's, that's a stasis. That's a, you know, that's a inertia. Um, and, 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 and that's an inertia that needs to be overturned. It you know, depends what you think government's role is. I happen to think government's role is as much to, to look after the welfare and well-being of its people, um, and, and perhaps more so than its companies, who tend to do pretty well. And, and that's increasingly true in, in, a, in a global situation. And governments are trying to just maintain that social net. Larry, your take on the, uh, the, the, the forces of, of stasis that can uh, that counteract this incapacity of governments to keep up. Yeah, I see, I see. I agree with you. I see both. You know, we have the horror stories and we have the wonder stories, and we're just inherently schizophrenic about technology. Uh, that's part of what makes us interesting. And maybe to go to the previous panel, that's part of what proves that we're human um, and not the replicants or, or, or androids. Uh, I agree. I, so I, it really does sometimes come down to who do you trust least? You know, big corporations or big governments? And I, somehow I think that's a very fundamental psychological question. I'm not sure what you know the origin of it is, but yeah, I, I definitely go on the side of being much, much more skeptical of big government, largely in part because, as you say, a lot of times, again, when it's a disruptive technology, the industries that have the vested interest that are not interested in the change or not interested in the pace of the change happening that's, that's you know, in some ways unavoidable, they're going to, you know, they're going to engage in rent-seeking behavior as much as possible to slow down or skew or, or they won't stop, they never do, but ultimately, you know, they're going to try to interfere and, you know, they have strong allies in the regulatory agencies because of the long working relationship. Again, this was exactly the same thing that happened on the American frontier. You know, the, the East was not interested in, in regulating the West to make the West as good a place as possible. They wanted to exploit the value of the land. They wanted to exploit, uh, what, you know, the crops and everything, the, the timber and everything that was being developed uh, as quickly as possible to, to, to build up their own coffers, either from a government standpoint or from the, from the industries back East. So I don't trust that relationship very much. I'm very skeptical of it. But it, you know, oftentimes it just comes down to who, who do you trust least. I think what I, I don't know what I see more from bi in biotech is uh, companies actually taking over the technology and driving it in ways that are, that are for their own interests rather than for other interests. So you know, we saw the, the genetic modification driven towards these crops that are about impre increasing the pesticide sales of a few companies. Um, that's a ridiculous direction to go in any kind of rational way, but it made sense for Monsanto and what was to become Syngenta and Bayer and so forth. What we're now seeing with synthetic biology are basically oil companies taking control so that they can move this towards keeping uh, something a little bit like oil. Uh, so they can keep their infrastructure and they can create biofuels that look a bit like gasoline and can go straight into a car so they don't have to change their infrastructure. So they're taking over the technology in the many ways it could go and driving it in what's actually going to be an extremely destructive direction. Okay. So it's not a couple of examples. Uh, one I think is interesting is a nanomagic in incident from about three years ago where uh, there was a report uh, from Germany that some 100 people had gotten sick from this brand new nanotech product called Magic Nano and six were hospitalized with uh, respiratory problems. Immediately we saw front page newspaper headlines across the country from groups like ETC saying, this, see, this is our point, we need an immediate worldwide ban on all nanotech products or moratorium on all nanotech products. A few days later the government of Germany came out with a report that says there's actually no nanotech in it. No one was saying let's ban the non-nanotech products. No one was saying, you know, these people are still in the hospital, they're still sick, but they didn't matter anymore. It would only matter if it was nanotech that hurt them. Uh, because of this, well, that's not this, this thing. Well, there's, there, there's no press. Did you guys put out a press release about banning, you know, non-nano products? No, but you didn't. didn't. You, as soon as you never said another word about it. Once it wasn't nano, you didn't care. Well, Those people can die for all you care. Then, let me give you a second example. Then, then you can do. That My second already. example is. Um, uh, so I, I got interviewed by a local TV station on a couple of risk things like uh, nail polish and stuff, and they asked me, do you have any other interesting risk stories? I said, I do. I just found this peer-reviewed study came out today showing organic foods have very high levels of very known carcinogen, mycotoxins. They get insect damage, mold grows, and you get this very potent carcinogen, and these organic foods have very, very high levels of them. Uh, you should do a story that organic foods have carcinogens in them. She says, great idea. Goes back, called me two days later and said, I talked to our, our, our boss. We can't talk about that. 
people would be too upset with us if we talked about that. Uh, you know, has, has ETC proposed applying the precautionary principle to organic foods? Is any organic food safety tested? Not a single one in the published literature. There's thousands on GM foods. Why aren't you calling for the precautionary principle to organic foods? It has known carcinogens. Uh, you know, 160 people just got sick in Illinois from uh, organic food on alfalfa sprouts. There's thousands of documented cases of people getting hurt. Where's the precautionary principle? Well, it's built into organic standards, actually. Oh, precautionary <laughs> principles is one, Where's of the, the safety one of the basis Where, of organic what standards. What safety testing do organic foods have? Well, anyway, not, I can't speak for the organic industry, I'm not sure, but, yeah. yeah but with no safety tests, no, no, no testing for carcinogens. Let me, uh, let me shift gears and, and uh, just as things are getting interesting. Um, <laughs> can't have that. Uh, to talk about uh, a kind of adjunct soft regulatory force uh, that, uh, uh, that often may have uh, maybe much more sort of supple and, and efficacious or uh, sort of powerful in a, in a benighted and, and uh, uh, ham-handed way, but nonetheless public opinion and the spotlight effect. So uh, it doesn't always matter if a corporate actor is, uh, is pleasing a regulator or staying within the letter of the law. If he does something and a civil society group or a media organization uh, uh, calls it to public attention and it's not popular with the public, uh, then that's a huge headache for that corporation, and that exerts constraints uh, on what corporations can do uh, that uh, often are much tighter and more binding, uh, and yet sort of more sort of changeable with the times uh, than, uh, than, than the uh, <coughs> regulatory process. And sort of in the bigger picture, uh, hasn't our culture moved uh, over the past generation or two, especially since the huge uh, uh, cultural changes in the 60s, towards generally uh, a much more skeptical attitude in public opinion uh, about, uh, uh, about the proclamations of science. Uh, once upon a time, if some guy in a, a white lab coat said it, then it was gospel uh, since uh, the environmental movement, since uh, experiences with Three Mile Island and so forth. Uh, there's been a lot more uh, uh, public skepticism about uh, the unquestioned beneficence of all things scientific. Uh, likewise, there's been a huge development of civil society organizations that didn't exist a, a generation or two before. So isn't this kind of adjunct regulatory force kind of much mightier today than it was uh, in the past? Uh, and isn't that a, a fairly powerful check on, uh, on, uh, on uh, technology producers? Occasionally. Um, you know, it's, uh, it depends who your target is. Uh, you know, it may be that a, a, a company that, that is a, has a consumer product that is directly affected, uh, and it's possible to put them in a spotlight, and, and maybe they'll move. But uh, you know, often often the company is responsible. You know, let's say Cargill. You know, Cargill. There's a company which has tremendous power in the global food system. Um, is, is pushing very hard, in fact, on synthetic biology um, and biofuels and so forth. Uh, doesn't have shareholders. Doesn't have any requirement to respond to any consumer, because consumers don't buy from Cargill on the whole. You buy some chickens, but that's about it. Um, you know, that, that it's not. That's not a very effective way of controlling that company. And that's true for a lot of actors within the market. The market isn't a democracy. It's, it, doesn't, it doesn't respond to public pressure. It responds to whoever has the most money and can, and can spend it appropriately. Um, just playing out this, uh, this uh, adjunct regulatory role, it, it's, it can go awry too, right? Because the demos is a, is a, is a fickle beast uh, and, uh, and it can get freaked out about things that really aren't very scary. Uh, and so it becomes a very powerful force. I mean, I, I think you see it playing out in, with a uh, the plasticizer or BPA, BSMLA right now, where you have, you know, government agencies are sort of equivocal, you know, this thing's been around 50 years, the, the science on it uh, was mostly pretty clean and now there's been some studies raising some concerns about it. Uh, you know, I've looked at this, frankly, I don't know what the answer is. I, my kids still have BSMLA water bottles, but I don't put them in the, uh, um, the washer, the, the, the washer but to heat them. Um, so I don't, I don't know what the answer is. I think a lot of people don't know, but the market's speaking very clearly, right? There's pressure from these groups and it's being stigmatized and consumers see that now. And so we're gonna move to a different plasticizer just because you know, the regulatory agencies aren't moving on this, uh, but the market is. And so the product manufacturers are all moving away from it. So it's a very powerful force to move away from this chemical we've been using for 50 years. Uh, the question is, what are we gonna move to, right? Uh, the, the chemical, most plastics most companies are moving to has not really been tested. So. Are we going to move something worse or better? Who knows? 
Um, you know, what does the science say? What if we do determine that this is sort of a fairly safe plasticizer? I don't know if that's the answer, but then, you know, we have basically these forces pushing us to do things that are, that are wrong. And so I think it is important that people are engaged and, and, and speak with their consumer as consumers. That's good. How do, we, how do we monitor that? How do we ensure that it's consistent with science? How do we uh, prevent it from being sort of pushed by scaremongers uh, or, or industry flax uh, the wrong way? Um, and, and that's, I think, a, a real challenge. Well, I think on BPA, I mean, it's, it's Health Canada who actually said that BPA shouldn't be used for... for they were the first act, but they also said it's and not so that, dangerous. That they then, said for well, adults, at least, there's no risk to it. But that then, that led to moving the market. Yeah. Actually, the market yeah. didn't move until Health Canada said, we're True. laying down this law. Right. So it was actually yeah. a regulatory move that moved right. it. Yeah, I was going to throw out the <laughs> vaccines and autism hullabaloo as exactly. an example where, right. uh, where public fears get right. spin out of control and then uh, actually uh, prevent people from doing something that's that's... Right. very, very prudent in terms of right. controlling known risks. Right. Can, can I give you an example from, from IT? Sure. So I, first of all, I'm amazed to find myself in the position of being a moderate <laughs> on the panel. Um, I mentioned before that, you know, the sort of potential for mob rule, uh, particularly when users get new tools and they're really not quite sure how powerful they are, and you're asking about the sort of adjunct regulatory function. I'll give you a good example of, of how it can be powerful and I think also how it can uh, go wrong. Uh, and that is with the response some years ago, now probably almost 10 years ago, to the very first experiments with using radio frequency ID technology uh, at the product level. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, it wasn't at the product level. It was, it was in fact, uh, at the warehouse level. But um, you know, so just not to go into great detail, but essentially RFID technology is self-scanning like a barcode, but it has the ability to, uh, to send and receive signal with very low, if not no, power source. Uh, and there's, you know, great potential for it to improve the efficiency of supply chains and product development and all these other things. The initial experiments were being done t 10 years ago in the warehouse and a group uh, arose in opposition to it uh, that uh, called Caspian and they claimed to have hundreds of thousands of members and they were very effective. They were very effective at using the media. They were very effective at getting their message out uh, and, you know, getting a seat at the table at various discussions. There were, there were laws proposed in the national level and state level in California passed essentially banning the use of the technology before the use had ever actually uh, come into anything like a cost-effective uh, opportunity. And not for good or evil, but it turns out that, that the, the woman behind Caspian uh, it was very clear and she wrote a book called Spy Chips and said, look, my main concern with RVD technology is that I'm convinced it is the technology that was prophesized in the book of Revelations as the sign of the devil that would bring about the apocalypse. Uh, and again, that's, that's obviously someone can have whatever view they want on the religious merits of it. But, you know, some, essentially what it turns out was that Caspian was really one person, one extremely media savvy person, and certainly held back or skewed the deployment of RFIT technology by at least 10 years. Uh, whether that's a good adjunct form of regulation or not, yes. I'll leave it to you. But a, a potentially powerful one. Let's open it up to questions from the uh, audience now. Uh, consider what's happened recently in the financial sector. Here we have an, we have an independent monetary authority run by industry experts, uh, which is uh, 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 very broadly uh, uh, independent of government influence, and uh, uh, the, an industry which is populated by supposed to be very smart people. Uh, who operate, uh, try to, they're supposed to be uh, maintaining some equilibrium through counterparty scrutiny, and yet, uh, to, to take up Larry's metaphor, uh, in that case, it was the Titanic. And uh, you know, that, that, sometimes, uh, you're, if you're on the Titanic, uh, you may not want to move the deck chairs, but you might want to do something. So th perhaps you guys could all address the question, what, given the fact that you were, extremely skeptical of, it sounds like, all conceivable coordination regimes which might mitigate the, resi the, the risks of catastrophic failures. What Do you propose that we just suffer catastrophic failures no, and so, address them after the fact? So, so I don't. I mean, I, so I, first of all, I think there is a very appropriate role for government as we, uh, you know, get uh, risks that are, are, are documented and so on, that their role should be to control those. I think on the cutting edge, they have a hard time dealing with brand new things to move it in any kind of nimble way to provide any kind of oversight. And I think in, in, in for those, we need some kind of other mechanism. And I don't think leaving it to industry is the answer. I don't think people would trust industry. I don't think uh, the record of industry would support trusting them. 
uh, solely, but I think industry has to be involved, but I think there needs to be partners with it. So there has to be responsible parties uh, from the civil society, public sector, uh, public interest sector, who would partner with them to help oversee this and provide the kind of model, what we call a soft law model, uh, uh, an adaptive, quick response. Uh, just to give you another example, in Netherlands, a lot of environmental regulation is done by covenants, where you have an environmental group, the industry, government agency, and the industry group who basically uh, sit down and, 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 and do a contract of, of what's going to be done about this problem. And as soon as there's a change in circumstance, they just meet next week and they change it. Uh, it doesn't go through the kind of public comments, so it's sort of cutting out the general public a little bit. That's a cost. But it's incredibly nimble, quick, and because all the key stakeholders at the parties, and maybe it's a much more coherent society than ours is, people trust it because everybody's at the table and everybody trusts at least one of the people at the table. Uh, right here. Sorry to take the floor again, but um, I, I just have a, a, a question based on, on kind of an overall philosophy. Do you, do you really think that the market, sometimes the way I hear the market being spoken of, it's almost as if the market were an organic thing, when it isn't really. The market is a collection of companies that are interested in making profits. And do you really think that the market is a better gauge to public policy than the professionals who, let's say, who uh, staff the regulatory agencies in government, who have stuff, usually come from your universities, by the way. Uh, I will recognize that um, uh, NGOs occasionally also are um, more interested in their own short-term interests. By the way, P Michael Crichton was mentioned earlier. I actually um, um, served with Michael Crichton at a Senate hearing on climate change in which Senator Imhoff, who was the chair of the uh, Senate Environment Committee, actually praised um, Michael's book, which you also, also should read, uh, the uh, novel that he wrote about climate change, in which he said that basically it was a fraud, that the real scientists weren't interested in it, and it was the NGOs who were pushing it to gain money from, to frighten the public to gain money. But um, the question is basically, if you're talking about government agencies versus the market, or the government agencies controlling tendencies in the market, uh, when we know that the pharmaceutical, I mean, it's, it's, no, it's, not, it's not a, a myth, that the pharmaceutical industry, that the food industry, has done everything possible to prevent consum consumers from even being, being able to read what's on labels and how, how big the print has to be, on how fine the print has to be on the labels. It seems to me that the issue is one of a short-term time perspective, and I'd just like to get your reaction to it. That's why it's a question. A short-term time perspective, which is basically the way most of our private enterprise operates. They want to make the money as quickly as possible versus a long-term time perspective on what's good in general for society. When I went to Harvard Business School, I have a doctorate from Harvard Business School many years ago, the professors were telling us, you know, business is not really, um, industry needs to be regulated because based on, they're looking to the next annual report and that's too short a time perspective. Now, in the meantime, we've seen from looking toward the next annual report, they're looking to the next quarterly profit and loss statement, how much they can make. Or even worse, they're looking to what the influence of a business decision is going to be on tomorrow's stock prices. This is the trend that I have seen as an econ someone who's tra trained as an economist with some regret over the last years. And I just wonder how you react to this. If you have to just say, well, who is more likely to come up with the right information? Is it, or the right judgment? Is it the guy who was looking at his stock price the next day? Or is it some regulatory agency which is staffed by people from your universities? So, well, I, I, yeah. Yeah, I, so again, my, my comments are limited to the information technology industry. I, I don't think the dichotomy that I see, I don't see it the same way you do. I don't think it's a, a choice between traditional governments or the market. And I don't necessarily think the market is just the companies. But leave that aside, uh, I think it's a choice between traditional governments who, as I say, move at a very slow and deliberative pace by design for good reasons versus more organic forms of governance that are developing within the technology themselves. So it's consumers, it's, it's citizens of the digital life, it's citizens of the internet who are developing their own forms of governance. Uh, and I find those much more promising than, yes, than the regulatory agencies who do not live where the rest of us live. Jim. Yeah, I mean, I, just to come to your question, my sense is that 
the governance that works is the governance where people are paying attention, and that's kind of, I think, what you're saying here. Um, that what you require is uh, an active citizenry or, or, or an active uh, civil society or, or whatever that's holding to account whatever the governance structure is and whether it's, you know, I have problems with the idea of a compact between some chosen NGO and uh, that's, that's easily, and in the Netherlands, in fact, is easily uh, corruptible. Um, and and I, I entirely agree with, with your concern because the companies don't have to have, a, a technology doesn't need to work. It just needs to work long enough in order to sell it. And at that point, you can move on. Um, and, and that means that, you know, I think we've seen that, in fact, with GMOs. We, we've seen a technology that actually hasn't delivered much of a promise. It hasn't really gone very far. It hasn't done very much. But for the Monsantos and Syngentas of the world, what it's done is allowed them to, to concentrate the seed industry, to gain control of the seed industry, and, and then they can move on. And, and so for them, it's worked perfectly. Um, but for society, it hasn't really done much apart from increased sales of a particular pesticide. Um, so that, they, that, that, that isn't, they don't have the interest of society at all in any length. Yeah, I, would, I would just chime in and say it's, uh, I think it's no good uh, trying to uh, make the call as to sort of who is wiser or a better person, uh, a government regulator or a market actor. Uh, uh, it's rather uh, what systems of decision making tend to produce better results over the longer run. Uh, and I would, uh, I would Put in, and here I wouldn't argue versus market versus government, but more broadly, uh, decentralized uh, decision-making make, processes that pull in information from, uh, from lots of different sources and that react positively and imitatively to success uh, and negatively uh, to, uh, to failure are decision-making processes that can learn. Uh, ones that are top-down uh, and that double down when they get things wrong uh, are, uh, are ones that... Uh, that uh, tend to get things wrong again and again and again, uh, right there in the red scarf. I'm Anne Rakuya Robbins. And I think we're missing uh, something of an obvious innovation, and that's self-regulation, and where associations, uh, institutions, organizations can internalize um, certain democratic activities and processes and make them a part of their activities. And uh, I've been experimenting with this myself in something I call virtual democratic countries, which sit as a layer over existing democracies and are really cauldrons of experimentation with democratic and constitutional uh, liberties uh, that, w that doesn't depend on civil laws or criminal laws, rather. So this experimentation can really go on very robustly and also has its own economic infrastructure. Uh, and just to follow up on that, one thing that people in democracies are very good at is internalizing, over time, some new behavior. Self-control is a part of a democratic, at least in an American point of view. We stop smoking, we decide to overcome uh, slavery, not maybe very willingly. But I just want to offer that as, what do you think of that as an option? Self-regulation. Jimmy, you just want to say bah humbug, or is there anything well, to uh, self-regulation at I mean, self-regulation was proposed for synthetic biology, I think, four or five years ago. Synthetic biology 2.0 in Berkeley in, what was that, 2005? Um, the synthetic biology community said we're going to create a bunch of self-regulation uh, pro proposals, and, and very clearly said it was a way of staving off regulation. That was, you know, that was what, what led that. They wanted to, to and, and we saw this, in fact, with biotech in, in terms of uh, um, Selimar back in 1975. Um, it, that self-regulation is often put forward as a way of saying, we're dealing with this, back off. Um, and, and that's, you know, I think where we've seen self-regulation type approaches, we've seen it in, in, in nanotech where, uh, you know, voluntary governance. Can you provide us with some data if you like to is basically the approach the FDA has taken, um, so the EPA has, t has taken on, on nanotech. 30, country, 30 companies have responded. The UK government did the same thing they got, I think it was two. Um, it, it doesn't work. Companies are not interested in ultimately in self-regulating apart from as a PR uh, uh, front in order to, uh, to avoid constraints. Um, there needs to be some, some good boundaries if you're going to have some trust. We're, we're, we're out of time and we could talk forever about this. Just give me one example. We talked this morning about virus and DNA virus things. The, 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 the sequence for a smallpox virus is on the internet. The recipe to make a live virus is on the internet. 
there's companies that sell DNA sequences. If you, there's no law against ordering the smallpox virus DNA. Go try doing it. You can't do it because of self-regulation. There is self-regulation that works. It's not only sufficient. It's not the only thing. But there is effective self-regulation. We have to think how to encourage it, how to grow it. It does play a role. Yeah. Please. So I, I think self-regulation does work on the Internet quite well. One of the best examples of that, obviously, is the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, which is responsible. It's a self-organizing virtual community of engineers who are responsible for maintaining and updating the basic protocols to keep the Internet being uh, the Internet. But it's also worth pointing out that self-regulation has a dark side as well. Michael Gottlieb used twice this morning an example of the comic book industry in the 1950s as an example of overregulation by the government. Uh, in fact, he got every fact about that story wrong. What actually happened was there were hearings held. Uh, the Kefauver Commission uh, asked a bunch of questions, started rattling the saber about regulation of the, of the industry. And what the industry did was to respond by overregulating itself. It created a voluntary self-regulated group called the Comics Code Authority, which banned nearly all the content uh, that was currently being published and pretty much destroyed the industry for the next 40 or 50 years. Definitely gave itself more regulations than would have ever passed Supreme Court scrutiny had the government done it under a First Amendment challenge. Uh, and so in some sense, that form of self-regulation, and you know, the same sort of thing happened in the movie industry as well, uh, can be overly regulatory and can do more harm than letting the regulators do what they were going to do or what they were threatening to do in the first place. Well, with that, I'm afraid we're out of time. We could go on for a long uh, period, but... Uh... We've got to get on to the next panel. Thank the uh, panelists.